Hello. A massive stone pyramid with nearly the same footprint as the very largest Egyptian ones. Finely carved jade figures of creatures that are half human baby and half jaguar. Colossal stone heads that weigh over 30 tons. And ceramic pots that are painted with beans sporting human arms and legs and dressed in armor, vigorously beating one another with axes and maces. These are just a few of the impressive and rather creative objects produced by the ancient cultures of North and South America. For the next three lectures, we will examine the civilizations of this region. The Americas were among the last portions of the world to be settled by human beings. For a long time, the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans acted as effective barriers. That is, until glaciers froze up enough water in the Bering Strait between Alaska and Siberia that a land bridge emerged above sea level. And people first migrated to the Americas by crossing the Bering Land Bridge, although exactly when that happened is still something that is much debated. Originally, that moment was dated to around 100,000 years ago. But some studies, which are based on genetics, point to a date more around 30,000 years ago. Yet other interpretations based on archaeological evidence would push that key event to as recently as 15,000 years ago. One common theory is that bands of hunters from Asia crossed over the Bering Strait in order to follow bison, caribou, and mammoths at the very end of the Ice Age. And genetic analysis of biological traits such as uh, certain blood proteins and shovel-shaped uh, incisor teeth do indicate that there is a common ancestry for the ancient inhabitants of Siberian Asia and Native Americans. These earliest peoples, often termed Amerindians or sometimes Paleo-Indians, engaged in a nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle. So they fished and they hunted uh, various game, both large and small. And there is clear evidence that they killed some huge animals, like mammoths and bison. But it's now being questioned uh, to what extent this sort of big game formed a significant part of their diet. But gradually, these peoples moved throughout North America and then ultimately down into South America as well. These nomads eventually began to plant some of the foods that they found growing wild. These were things like uh, beans and squashes, and seeds have been found uh, that hint that their cultivation began at least 8,000 years ago. Uh, around 6,500 BC, we know that squash, chili peppers, avocados, as well as corn were among the earliest domesticated crops being grown in the highlands of Mesoamerica. Although corn cobs at that point were only as large as one's little finger. By the way, it would take another 3,000 years before selective breeding had increased the size of corn up to thumb-sized cobs. And those uh, giant foot-long corn that we enjoy today at the market nicely illustrate just how much we really have warped domesticated plants from their original wild ancestors. Ultimately, just as in Mesopotamia, India, and China, the practice of agriculture would profoundly change these peoples. So as more and more of their diet uh, was derived from farmed crops, the hunter-gatherers would begin to settle down into more sedentary communities. And once they started to develop crop surpluses, you have villages and small cities developing, and soon thereafter, you get all the cultural developments that we've been tracing in the other civilizations around the world. In the Americas, the groups who made that fundamental leap from farming, uh, or fundamental leap to farming and urbanism, clustered mostly in just two regions. One of those, often called Mesoamerica, stretched from the arid highlands of what today is central Mexico down into the jungle regions of the Yucatan Peninsula and into Guatemala and the other Central American countries. The second region was a narrow strip 
along the northwestern coast of what is today Peru. And this strip encompassed portions of the high Andes Mountains, as well as some coastal zones down to the sea. And as always, the geography and natural resources of those two regions will play a determining role in the cultures that develop there. So let's first look a little bit at the environments of those two areas. First, Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica had two basic environments. In central and western Mexico, there is a high, uh, dry plateau where there's nice, cool valleys, and these were attractive places to settle. More to the east and the south were grassy, uh, open plains and a steamy tropical rainforest with lush vegetation. And the major Mesoamerican civilizations tended to arise either up in the highlands or down in the lowlands. But with the exception of the Maya, usually not both. And while certain basic crops and resources can be found in both regions, a number of the items which were most prized by these various civilizations only occurred in one or the other area. For example, obsidian, the uh, sharp-edged black volcanic stone that was widely used to make knives and weapons, could only be obtained in the highlands. Whereas on the other hand, cacao and cotton were widely cultivated only in the lowlands. And so what this meant in practical terms is that the early Mesoamerican societies were always dependent on one another for vital goods. So there was always a lively trade going on between the two regions because neither of them could achieve economic self-sufficiency. All of the cultures that developed in Mesoamerica featured a number of common elements. First of all, not only were their economies interdependent as we've seen, but the available crops and animals that they basically subsisted on were also the same. So all Mesoamerican cultures farmed primarily corn, beans, and squash. Certain cultural practices that were shared by almost every Mesoamerican civilization included that they all used glyphs as writing, that they built pyramids topped with temples, that they had very similar calendars. They almost all played a specific ball game that had religious overtones. They all tended to practice human sacrifice. They all wrote on a paper made from bark, and they used cocoa beans as a form of money. And they worshipped a polytheistic pantheon of gods, which included a goggle-eyed water deity, and also a, a feathered serpent god as well. Turning now to the section down in South America, if we look at the northwestern edge of Peru, that's the other origin point of New World civilizations. And in that region, there were also two distinct climatic zones. First, you have the western slopes of the Andes Mountains, which go down to the coast, and that was basically a, uh, a desert-like region. So it wasn't very well suited for agriculture. But what that zone did have was lots of sea life in the waters just offshore. On the other hand, the high mountain plateaus and the eastern slopes of the Andes got a lot of moisture. Uh, this comes from the prevailing winds which had come in from the Amazon basin. And so up in those highlands, it's possible to make uh, terraced fields where all the usual New World staple crops, corn and beans, squash, could be grown. In addition, South American farmers could plant another very useful crop, potatoes. And just as in the north in Mesoamerica, a vibrant trade developed very early on between the low coastal lands and the higher uh, inland areas up in the mountains. And they would exchange fish and shells for corn, potatoes, and beans. Also as in the north, certain distinctive cultural constants developed that would span all the different civilizations that arose in that region. And some of these that were specific to this region included mummifying the dead and religions that had very prominent sun gods. 
The civilizations of North and South America got going considerably later than those in the Mediterranean, Mesopotamia, India, and China. So they domesticated crops and animals at least 5,000 years later than the other parts of the world that we've examined. And they never developed at all some of the key technologies that those other regions enjoyed. For example, none of the New World civilizations used wheels for transportation, even though they did sometimes have wheels on toys. Most of these civilizations employed stone for tools and weapons, and they never developed metalworking. Or else they did develop metalworking, but only applied it to decorative things like jewelry. And while some New World cultures did invent various forms of writing, none of them got much past the, the pictograph stage. And so these were not nearly as flexible as the true alphabetic or sign systems that were used elsewhere in the world. There have been lots of attempts to try and explain these discrepancies among world civilizations, why one seemed to have developed faster than the other. And one of the more interesting of these attempts was popularized about a decade ago by an author named Jared Diamond, who wrote a book called Guns, Germs, and Steel. And certainly the people who lived in North and South America were no less intelligent or creative than people elsewhere. But due to environmental factors, he argues that they may simply have been at a great disadvantage. And two uh, especially vital areas in which this may have been the case are in the wild plants that were available for cultivation and the animals that were available for domestication. There are about 200,000 species of wild flowering plants. And of that enormous number, only a couple hundred are actually routinely eaten by humans. And of those, just 12 account for 80% of the world's crops. Uh, if you're curious, those 12 are wheat, corn, rice, barley, sorghum, soybeans, potatoes, manioc, sweet potatoes, sugarcane, sugar beet, and bananas. The most important category of crops, by far, are the cereals. And even today, uh, cereals uh, contribute more than 50% of all calories which are consumed by human beings. Well, when ancient humans set about domesticating wild grasses into modern crops like wheat, there were 56 possible grasses that contained heavy seeds that, that were suitable for doing this with. And these potential sources of domesticated cereals were not distributed evenly around the globe, and they would not grow in all climates. In fact, those potential uh, cereal plants were heavily concentrated in certain geographic regions. 32 of the 56 were in the zone of the Mediterranean Sea and the ancient Near East, including Mesopotamia. By contrast, Eastern Asia had only six. But luckily for them, one of those was rice, which was very well suited to being a staple crop, so that worked out okay. If we turn to Africa, though, there were only four possible candidates, and not very good ones. And finally, in South America, there were just two. So, purely by geography, the Mediterranean region was predisposed to give rise to highly useful farm crops, whereas areas like Africa and South America were almost completely lacking in potential high-yield grains. And this, of course, explains why beans, squash, and corn dominated in the diets of New World cultures. Secondly, uh, almost the same way with wild crops, while there are many large mammals, there are very, very few that are suitable for domestication. And these two are unevenly distributed. As it turns out, there are exactly 148 large mammals that might be considered possibilities for domestication. And of those, there are only 14 that are actually well-suited to be domesticated. Um, all the others fail due to all kinds of things, diet, growth rate, uh, inability to breed in captivity, uh, the inability to live in herds, or some of them are just simply too mean 
Of those 14 potential big animals, nine are considered marginally suitable, so not very good. And that leaves only five that have proven to be really well suited for domestication. Can you guess what those five vital animals are? Well, it's cows, sheep, goats, pigs, and horses. All five of those can be found in Europe and Asia, but none of them were indigenous to North and South America. South America did have one marginally useful domesticable animal, that's the llama. North America had none. And incidentally, this may be one reason why the wheel was not used for transportation in the New World. Uh, it, it wasn't that they couldn't think of a wheel, but they had no large animals that you could hook up something, uh, a cart or a wagon to. The largest domestic animal that the Mesoamericans had were little dogs and guinea pigs. And sure enough, both of those were raised for food. But those are no substitute for big animals like cows and sheep. A subsidiary effect of raising large domesticated animals has to do with infectious disease. Throughout human history, some of the major killers of humanity have been seven deadly infectious diseases. These are smallpox, influenza, tuberculosis, malaria, plague, measles, and cholera. Do you know where all of these diseases originally evolved from? Well, they all originated among large domesticated animals, and then they spread to humans because of their close proximity with those herds. So for example, measles and smallpox originally came from cows. Influenza originally developed among pigs. And all of those diseases are most destructive when they become introduced into a population of humans among whom they've previously been unknown. And that's exactly what happened, for example, when the Spanish conquistadors reached Mexico and they brought with them all of these uh, animal-derived diseases, which the local population had never been exposed to because they didn't have those animals. By the way, in case you were wondering how Africa stacks up in regard to all of these issues, it turns out that Africa was particularly shortchanged by geography. The largest domesticatable animal in Africa was a bird called a guinea fowl, and sub-Saharan Africa had absolutely no good grains whatsoever. The best crop uh, available for cultivation there was yams, which indeed a lot of cultures uh, cultivated. It's intensive agriculture and uh, animal domestication that really make it possible to feed large cities. And as we've seen, it's in large cities that most technological innovations are produced. So you can argue that those disadvantages left Africa far behind in the technology race. Well, this is only part of Diamond's larger argument. And indeed, uh, a number of people have challenged various aspects of his kind of thesis of uh, environmental determinism. But the fundamental lack of good domesticatable plants and animals in the Americas and Africa certainly played uh, an important role in how those civilizations developed. And as we'll see in the following lectures, all of these areas still gave rise to highly sophisticated, impressive, and, and original cultures. But Diamond's theories may help to explain why, when they eventually came into contact with European explorers, they were just at a disadvantage in terms of technology, uh, as well as other key factors such as resistance to disease. So, for almost 2,000 years, we have these new world civilizations evolving in near total isolation from the rest of the world. And they produce some very uh, memorable and distinctive and creative cultures. Over the rest of this lecture and the next two that will follow, uh, I'd like to examine some of those cultures in greater depth. And we'll look at their art, their architecture, and some of their beliefs as well. The earliest of the Mesoamerican urban cultures to emerge, and maybe the earliest major one in all the Americas, was a group known as the Olmecs. They developed around 1200 BC in the jungle, the low-lying regions 
along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. And this is uh, what is now today the Mexican states of Veracruz and Tabasco. While many aspects of their civilization uh, remain mysterious, or things that people are debating about, um, these cultures are important because it's clear that they would exercise a strong influence on all of the Mesoamerican cultures that came after the Olmecs. They're often uh, characterized as a sort of mother culture for the entire region. Uh, it was they who established the model for pyramid building. Uh, they came up with a calendar that seems to be very similar to the more famous later Mayan calendar. They developed the pantheon of many gods that seems to have spread all throughout Mesoamerica. And certain uh, artistic pursuits, such as uh, portraiture and obsidian mirror making, also seem to have originated with the Olmecs. As with Harappan civilization in India and Minoan civilization in Greece, almost all of what we know about the Olmecs is derived just from archaeological evidence, rather than textual or historical accounts. The Olmecs are probably best known for their big ceremonial centers, which uh, were constructed on a large scale. And these were hacked out of the dense forests. And the art and architecture that adorn them is very distinctive. These are called ceremonial centers, not really cities, because they seem to have been sites mainly intended just for religious rituals. Um, they don't seem to have uh, economic or residential buildings. But again, to be honest, we know practically nothing about uh, Olmec domestic life. The most famous of these centers is in a place called La Venta. And it was constructed along a north-south axis. And clearly very careful attention was paid to the geometrical relationships between its various structures. La Venta features a huge earthen pyramid that's over 300 feet high, as well as lots of smaller step pyramids. And buried underneath the main courtyard are slabs of various precious stones, jade, granite, and serpentine, which form images of monster and jaguar heads. And clearly these were not meant to be seen, uh, they were buried right after they were created. Offerings found there consist of precious items, such as jade axes, and these were placed in many of the burials. Unfortunately, uh, we just don't know what sort of rituals were actually performed at this very uh, impressive architectural setting. The apparent focus of Olmec city planning and art uh, has inspired the theory that maybe there was a sort of priestly elite who enjoyed the highest social status and who were in charge of Olmec society. And the remains of Olmec sites uh, clearly show that they were skillful engineers who had huge amounts of labor at their disposal. Their earliest ceremonial center, which seems to have been populated by about 2,500 people, is today called San Lorenzo. And it was made on a uh, man-made artificial earth platform over half a mile long that's elevated up above the surrounding terrain so that it wouldn't be affected by the frequent flooding in the area. The most stereotypical, as well as the most impressive, surviving Olmec artifacts are also among the most mysterious. And these are a series of colossal basalt heads, which are between six and nine feet in height. And in all, there have been about 25 of these heads found. And it's speculated that they might be actual portraits of Olmec kings. They all have a very similar distinctive look. They're round-faced, uh, chubby-cheeked, broad-nosed, and they all have a kind of odd leather helmet on their head. Some of them feature scars or blemishes on the face or even gaps in the teeth. And so this has been interpreted that maybe they represent actual individuals. The largest of these heads weighs 30 tons or more. And the blocks of the volcanic stone out of which these colossal heads are carved in some cases, had to be transported from quarries that were over 70 miles away from their fine site. Probably for most of that distance, they would have been floated down a river and then maybe heaved through the jungle to their final resting places. There's a later origin myth uh, 
which says that a jaguar mated with a woman who then gave birth to a baby that ate her as she nursed it and then eventually sort of grew up to become the first ruler. And so another typical Olmec art object are statues which depict jaguar wear babies that have fangs, uh, jaguar paws, that helmet thing again, and are sometimes shown eating their mothers while nursing. And some scholars believe that the giant uh, baby-faced ruler's heads might refer to that myth, linking them again with jaguars who are closely associated with the gods in later Mesoamerican belief. Olmec art in general often mixes up features of babies, jaguars, and, and all sorts of other animals, including toads, snakes, eagles, and uh, caimans, which are a, a relative of crocodiles. And again, to be honest, we really don't know for sure what these massive heads represent or symbolize. The Olmecs developed uh, an extensive trade network. They would import goods such as basalt, obsidian, and iron ore from Mexico's west coast, and even from as far south as Costa Rica. The wealth of Olmec society allowed them to bring in luxury items from very far away. And of these, the most important trade item was jade. Uh, jade probably had to come from as far away as Guatemala. And out of that jade, the Olmecs loved to make jewelry. Uh, masks, and various ritual objects. And in general, jade was considered the most precious material by Mesoamerican cultures, uh, even more so than gold. So that later on, uh, the conquistador Hernán Cortés found that he could trade green glass beads for gold. The trade links, which were established by the Olmecs, um, certainly helped to contribute to that cultural uh, homogeneity that was evident in much of ancient Mesoamerica, especially in terms of religion. The Olmec gods, these sort of half-human, half-animal supernatural creatures, some of the core myths and various religious symbols, all of these would provide prototypes for later Mesoamerican deities and religious beliefs. The Olmecs also played a ceremonial ball game that would spread throughout the region. Olmec centers often have ball courts, and little clay uh, ball player figurines have been discovered at La Venta as well as other sites. By at least 600 BC, the Olmecs had apparently created the first form of writing in Mesoamerica. And this was a fairly crude hieroglyphic system that many scholars believe was a forerunner to the later more famous Mayan glyphs. The Olmec hieroglyphs, which are mostly known from a single slab, have yet to be deciphered. The Olmecs are also credited with the first calendar in Mesoamerica, which was something that they needed uh, for religious purposes, and its main application seems to have been to record various religious cycles and to determine the right date to hold certain rituals. For reasons that remain uncertain, Olmec civilization seems to have collapsed, or maybe just kind of faded away sometime around the 4th century BC. There is some archaeological evidence of Olmec sites suffering severe depopulation in that period. And some scholars have uh, tried to ascribe that to shifts in climate. But the template, the model, that the Olmecs had established would continue, and it would exert a powerful influence over all later Mesoamerican cultures. In the next lecture, we'll travel to South America, and we'll take a look at the earliest cultures that developed there, as well as coming back to Mesoamerica and looking at some of the later civilizations in that place. Thank you.